friends, welcome to Machine Learning Experts. I'm your host, Brittany Muller, and today's guest is none other than Margaret Mitchell. Meg for short, uh, Meg founded and co-led Google's Ethical AI Group, is a pioneer in the field of machine learning, has published over 50 papers, and is a leading researcher in ethical AI. You're going to hear Meg talk about the moment she realized the importance of ethical AI, such a good story, uh, how machine learning teams can be more aware of harmful data biases, and the power and performance benefits of inclusion and diversity in machine learning. If you want to learn more about how Hugging Face experts like Meg can help accelerate your machine learning roadmap, please go to hf.co slash support or simply Google Expert Acceleration Program to learn more. So excited to introduce you to this really powerful episode. Here is my conversation with Meg Mitchell. Meg Mitchell, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. And is it okay if I call you Meg or do you prefer yes. to go by Margaret? Okay, just wanna make yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I publish as Margaret, um, yeah. but yeah, everyone has to call me. Perfect. Perfect. Curious if you could just speak a little bit about your incredible background and experience and what ultimately led you to your role at Hugging Base. Yeah, nice <laughs> of you. Yeah, so I can speak to my bachelor's first, where I focused on linguistics, but I had always really been interested in programming and was like programming on the side from when I was a lot younger. And so by the end of my linguistics bachelor's, I was doing natural language processing work, sort of looking at generation in particular. So how do we take some structured representation and generate language from it, like describing scenes? And then from there, I ended up working on uh, assistive technology for a while. I continued to work on assistive technology. Well, I should say assistive and augmentative, as well as methods for automatic diagnosis of different kinds of neurological disorders. So like Parkinson's, as well as things like autism. So that work was something that I then continued throughout my master's and PhD. So I would like go back in the summer or whatever, or keep working on it for about seven years. I ended up doing my master's in computational linguistics at the University of Washington with Emily Bender, who is really awesome. And if you're not aware of her work, like I highly recommend checking it out. And then from there, I went on to do a PhD in computer science where I worked with Ehud Ryder, who's a little bit known in the generation world, at least, where I looked at how to generate language from computer vision. And then from there, I did some more like heavy statistical work as a postdoc at Johns Hopkins. And then from there, I went to Microsoft Research, where I continued doing vision to language generation I combined that with my interest in assistive technology by working on an app for people who are blind to be able to navigate the world a little bit more easily, which is a product called Seeing AI, which Microsoft still offers, which is cool. And then after a few years there, I went on to Google as a sort of new chapter of my life to focus on what was increasingly becoming an issue in uh, machine learning, which is the big data problems that are inherent in deep learning. So around 2011, 2012, massive uptick in deep learning, which also meant a massive uptick in really problematic things that models were picking up from large data. Mm -hmm. So that's when I started focusing on things like fairness, rigorous evaluation for different kinds of issues and bias issues. And that ended up kind of spinning into this organization at Google, focusing on machine learning fairness. And I was able to get a group of people who were excited about what I was doing as a team. 
and we became the ethical AI team focusing on like inclusion and transparency and all these related issues. And then I was joined uh, by my co-lead, Timnika Brew, and together we were able to build up a much larger team where we had uh, someone with a background in sociology, people who were more maybe interdisciplinary, sort of technical, as well as uh, social science sort of work. And then from there, that was about, that was four years. From there, I went to Hugging Faith. I, I was able to jump in and just focus on coding, which after so many years of the higher level stuff, I was just really yeah. aching to just code and not be in meetings, not lead anything. <laughs> <laughs> like I just wanted to be like a computer scientist. So, so they kindly let me join and like just code for a while. And now in, in this year, 2022, I'm, I'm helping a lot more with building up protocols for inclusive hiring and the stuff around setting up a good culture that is, you know, inclusive and diverse, as well as like NLP tasks and helping to expand to computer vision. And yeah, and that brings us to now. That's incredible. I love hearing you know, experts and professionals like you who have this extensive background that still just love being in the weeds and love yeah. programming yeah. and then yeah. I love that. That's my that's my happy place, definitely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's important. It's important to, you know, funnel that. Right. Um, yeah. That's so cool. I'm curious, so throughout that experience, if you can pinpoint the moment in which you discovered the importance of data ethics and yeah. ethics and machine learning. Yeah. Yeah. So this is when I was at Microsoft working on the assistive technology, working on seeing AI. In general, I was working on generating language from images. And what I was starting to see was just how just how I would guess I would say lopsided data was just, they just, it, data just really represents a subset of the world as it is. And it really influences what a model will say. So I was starting to run into issues where white people would be described as people and black people would be described as black people. So like, as if white was a default and black right. was a marked character, um, characteristic. So that was concerning to me. There was a, there was sort of an aha moment where I was feeding my system a sequence of images, getting it to talk about more of like a story of what's happening. And I fed it some images about this massive blast at a factory where a lot of people worked. It was called the Hebstead blast. And you could see from the sequence of images that the person taking the picture was on like the second or third story looking out at the blast and the blast was very close to this person. And you could see there was the news on in the corner and it was like talking about the blast and the view from the news was basically like the same view that this person had. So oh. it was just like this really dire, intense moment. And I, I fed it through to the system and the system was like, this is awesome. This is a great view. This is beautiful. And you're like, it is a great view of this right. horrible scene. Right. But what's important here is that people might be dying. This is a massive yeah. destructive explosion. Yeah. But the thing is, when you're learning from images, people don't tend to take pictures of horrible things. People right. take Im images of like going to parties, like having fun, sunsets, things like that. So it had learned right. like, oh, I'm looking at the sky. I see like blue and red, like it's beautiful. And it just really struck me that that was just one hop away from a system that would potentially blow up buildings because it thought it was beautiful. Right. right. You give something with that sort of thinking access to actions and now things can be. Yeah. So that was really a moment for me where I realized 
I didn't want to keep making these systems do better on benchmarks. I wanted to fundamentally shift how we were looking at these problems, how we were approaching data and analysis of data, how are we evaluating, and all of the factors that we were leaving out with just these yeah. like straightforward pipelines. So that really became the shift to, to ethical AI work. Wow, that is a very powerful example. And I'm sure you've <laughs> seen so many since. Yeah. And what applications is data ethics most important? Yeah, yeah. So it's in human-centric technology. Yeah. So human-centric is technology that that deals with people. So envision it's things like face recognition, pedestrian recognition, all of these uh, things that have to do with classification, detection, and recognition of people. In, in natural language processing, it has to do with things like privacy of individuals, how individuals mm -hmm. are talked about, and the biases that models pick up about the descriptors used for different people. So, you know, if you're just talking about random objects or things like that, there's not as much of a risk of personal harm because there isn't personal things involved. It's not people. And so across the board, regardless of the technology, it's when we start dealing with people and specifically identity that, that some of the most massive issues come up with the highest potential for harm. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. How, how can teams using machine learning be more consciously aware of some of that, you know, potentially harmful bias that's going on? Yeah. Well, I think part of it is just that these kinds of concerns haven't generally been taught in computer science. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people just aren't aware of the issues. And if they were, they would care more. That's, that's definitely true for a lot of people. There's a lack of knowing the kind of lexicon, like how to talk about things. So you have a sense sometimes that there's a problem, but you don't necessarily have the vocabulary to talk about what that is. And then yeah. that can be a barrier to, well, first to like contextualizing what's going on, but also to communicating with others about these kinds of issues. And so I found that a lot of what ends up helping people is simply having a lexicon, like... Like, this is what marginalization is. This is what a power yeah. differential is. This is how that becomes relevant in terms to discrimination that can come from a system. Here's how stereotypes work. Here's what inclusion is. Here's what diversity yeah. is. This is the difference between them. And so having a bit of more of a lexicon and an, and an understanding of some of the pillars ends up being really helpful. And I think another issue is just the culture around machine learning and deep learning in particular has, has tended to take a bit of a, a sort of alpha or maybe macho approach for, for mm -hmm. lack of a sort of better word, where the focus is really on beating, right? So you want to beat right. the last numbers. <laughs> you want right. to make things faster and bigger and you know, yeah. there's lots of parallels that can be made to like human anatomy or whatever. Like, oh yeah, <laughs> it's bigger. That's better. Definitely. Yeah. But, but, and, and there's like a very sort of hostile competitiveness that, right. that comes out where you often find that women disproportionately are treated less than. And since women are often much more familiar with discrimination, Women yeah. often are focusing a lot more on ethics, which and things around prejudice and stereotypes and sexism, which means it gets associated with women more, and it gets it, it's seen as less than. So, so the culture is really, really difficult to penetrate. Sometimes, I definitely um, not someone. It's generally not assumed that I'm technical. It's something that I sort of have to prove over and over again, but I'm called a linguist or I'm called an ethicist because these are things I care about and know, about. but that's treated as less than, you know, you don't program, right. you don't know about statistics. You are 
not as important. And it's often not until I start talking about things statistically or programming things or whatever that people do take me more seriously, which is unfortunate. Yeah. But yeah, there's really a massive cultural barrier there as well. Oh, you make so many good points in that. And I've noticed that. And we've heard Brene Brown talk about that recently on her podcast, where yeah. she gets deeply offended when people refer to her as a motivational speaker and not right. a scientist. Like she's right. a researcher. She is yeah. an academic. And the yeah. fact that we, you know, you have to even prove that yeah. is so yeah. painful and ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, I'm regularly called an ethicist and I'm a computer scientist. Uh, right. I'm flattered that like all of, you know, like the ethical studies that one has to do to be an ethicist is being imbued in me. Like that's very flattering. It also right. might be kind of offensive to ethicists, uh, <laughs> but there's definitely just that assumption there. And I think it's especially when you're a woman that it really, yeah. it really comes to, comes to a head where you're, you, it's like, they don't want to see you as technical or something like that. Uh, right. They don't want to see you as a scientist or something like that. So it becomes, right. yeah, yeah, really difficult. And to your point, they, most men in the field won't pick up on the biases as quickly as women might. I know I'm just a very novice machine learning hobbyist, but there's been models where I will feed pictures of myself and they've cut my butt off and put a cell phone right. wallet in my back pocket as if I'm a man wearing jeans. Right. Yeah. It's very yeah. interesting. You know, it's like, yeah. Yeah. And that's partially a function of, of the people who are developing the technology, you know, they're right. just not, they don't have the world of being a woman in their heads. And so they right. miss a lot of that stuff. And, you know, it's, it's true for people with marginalized characteristics in general. So one of the close friends I made at Google was a black man. And part of why we became close was because we could see the patterns of marginalization that was happening to the other that no one else saw. Mm. So we would see that one another were often being left off of emails where we were the most qualified person to be on that email. The kind of thing where if you bring up, you're sort of called a complainer or whatever. But he and I both had the life of experiencing this kind of stuff. So we saw this happening to one another and we were able to stand up for one another yeah. and things like that. It's, it's just something that a lot of people miss unless they've had experience with discrimination. Yeah, that's a great point. I'm curious, you know, I think it's so important to have advocates, especially, you know, internally at organizations that size. Are there any other things that you know, people, minorities and different people are just experiencing those sorts of kind of, you know, subtle discriminatory acts can do to to better, you know, be effective in their role and make things a bit more fair? Yeah. So I think this is where the understanding of inclusion really comes uh, into play. And, uh, so just to kind of ground this, diversity would be when you have a lot of different races, ethnicities, genders, ability statuses at the table. Inclusion mm -hmm. is when each person feels comfortable talking. They mm -hmm. feel welcome. And, and one of the best ways to be inclusive is to not be exclusive. I think that's fairly obvious and yet it's completely missed where there's kind yeah. of like this very exclusionary behavior that happens you know we don't want this person in the meeting because we don't find them helpful which is a function of already biases or because we find them annoying or aggressive or combative which is also a function of various biases and there tends to be this this push towards being exclusionary in, in a bunch of ways where we can create more inclusive spaces as soon as we realize that to be inclusive, you have to not be exclusive. And right. so what that means, you know, very concretely is if you are creating a meeting and a bunch of people pay attention to the demographic makeup of the people you're inviting. If your meeting is all male, it's a problem, but you'll find you know, in tech, a lot of meetings are all male. And if you bring it up, that can be met with a lot of hostility. So I think it's about understanding that there are strategies here 
literally yeah. looking through, thinking through the demographics and making sure that each associated woman, each associated Black person, you know, Latinx person that is relevant to the project is also included. I like to say err on the side of including people. Right. Especially when it comes to marginalized characteristics, it's much better to have someone who who might not be as relevant than to exclude someone who is relevant. So erring on the side of inclusion, when I was first trying to sort of train my head to be less biased, I mean, we're all, we're all biased in our own ways. We all were raised with cultural norms that really affect how we perceive things. And so part of how I've tried to break those patterns is like I spent a good year probably whenever I wrote an email, I would look at everyone who was in the two and in the CC, and I would go through in my head their genders and ethnicities and things like that. And if I noticed that we were, that it was sort of non-representative of all the people yeah. working on the problem, I would fix that. But it took like concretely thinking about what are the important characteristics that tend to be marginalized? And right. then now I am going to unmarginalize them or, or unmarginalize the people with those characteristics. So it's a very conscious effort. And that's something that, you know, I guess, depending on the culture that people have been brought up in, they're more or less um, interested in, in doing. I think in the yeah. U.S., there has been a good response to that kind of approach. I'm less sure in, in France, which is like also very, you know, where hugging face is, how much yeah. that's appreciated. But at least, at least in the U.S., like that kind of very intentional thinking through demographics helps and, and people are, are generally responsive to that. As long as you tell them beforehand, if you, right. if you catch them in the moments, of yeah. like only preferring majority characteristics, like people get very mad and defensive. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, as long as you mention it beforehand, <laughs> that it's usually a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really great thing to be aware of. I'm curious too, you know, I feel most of us at Hugging Face are pretty data centric and data aware. And I just, I can't help but wonder and think about, isn't there proof how inclusivity and diverse individuals working on the singular project produce more successful outcomes? Yeah. 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 Since you have, I mean, minimally, since you have different perspectives, you have a dis a different distribution over options, and you have more options. Right. And so, you know, one of the fundamental things about machine learning is like how you should start training. Whether you want to use some, you know, randomized starting point, and what kind of distribution you want to sample from, and most people agree that you don't want to sample from this one little piece of the distribution in order to have. Right. The, I, the best chances at finding like, like a, you know, an optimum, like a local optimum. So that's understood in machine learning. Yeah. Uh, and so it's just sort of, you need to translate that to the people at the table, like just how you want to have this like Gaussian sort of oh <laughs> approach God. distribution over different kinds of start states. So too, do you want that at the table when you're starting projects? Because it gives you this larger search space and makes it much easier to get to some sort of local optimum. Absolutely. I've never heard it explained like that. I think that is brilliant. <laughs> yeah, I think it's I think it's maybe something that resonates with machine learning people a little bit, <laughs> a little bit yeah. more easily than saying like, you want different totally. perspectives. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. I love that so much. So Shifting a little bit on to some of the incredible work you've done around model cards. I know this also yep. stemmed from this effort to make models more transparent. And I'm just curious, how how did this particular project come about? And yeah. then, you know, where you see it heading in the future? Yeah. So the model cards project first started at Google. I was, when I first started, I was working on things like fairness and what a rigorous evaluation for fairness would look like. In order to figure out what evaluation to use, you have to have a sense of 
the context that the technology will be used in, who could potentially use it, both in terms of your intended users and malicious actors, because that really informs the kinds of things that you want to evaluate through ethical and fairness lenses. And so I was working really hard on building up these kind of design documents for how to approach model analyses. And it wasn't getting a lot of pickup. And then around, I forget the year, I want to say it was late 2017, 20, early 2018. I was talking to uh, Tim Neat, who was at, at that time, someone else in the field with similar interests to me. And she was talking about this idea of data sheets, where it's a kind of documentation for data based on her experience at Apple doing engineering stuff where you tend to have specifications of hardware, but we don't have something similar for data. And she was just talking yeah. about how crazy that is. And so she had this idea of data sheets for data set. And it really struck me that by, by having this idea of an artifact, suddenly that's something that people in tech who are motivated for launches would care a lot more about. So right. if we say you have to produce this artifact and even further, you can launch that and have it count as a launch, then suddenly people are incentivized to do it. So I thought a lot about taking the work I was doing and then packaging it similar to a data sheet to make it more palatable in the tech world. Uh, and so then I was trying to think of what is like a syn like not a synonym, what's a comparable word to data sheet that could be used yeah. for models. I did want to do something that was shorter in part because I was keying on this idea of launches that people will use. And so I was like, well, it needs to be shorter. So I guess instead of a sheet, it's like a card uh, yeah. and then data model. And so her paper she was working on at the time to talk about data sheets was called data sheets for data sets. And so we ended up calling ours model cards for model reporting. And then once we had the published paper, like everyone started taking it seriously, like both in terms of internally at Google and then externally in, in the tech world. So, yeah, I, I definitely wow. would not have gotten there if it weren't for T Tim Neat's brilliance of, oh, you need an artifact, you know, yeah. you need to make this like a standard thing that people want to produce. Right. Um, that's genius. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. fascinating. We also decided to call it model cards because there were a lot of things at the time that could be used as words in the fairness realm, like fairness reports or like transparency reports or whatever. But the more we talked about it, the more that seemed like something that would soon be dated. I really wanted mm. to have a generic term that like, even if fairness and ethics was something people didn't care about anymore, the fundamental yeah. idea would persist. Um, yeah. and so it struck me that like saying model card, as opposed to some other stuff that came out afterwards, like transparency report, like those didn't catch on as much. And I think in part, because they weren't addressing this need to have it be something very generic that would then resonate no matter, no matter what you're working on. Um, right. So that was also like a little bit, just, just the name, I think really helped. <laughs> that is brilliant. I've never thought of that longevity of just the right. name itself. Yeah. 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 Very cool. I'm curious. So where do you see model cards headed in the future? Yeah. So there's a pretty big barrier to entry uh, for doing model cards in a way that's well informed by ethics. In part because the people who need to fill out these things are often engineers and developers who want to launch their model. They don't want to sit around and think about ethics and like write up documentation relevant. And so part of why I wanted to join Hugging Face actually was because it gave me the opportunity to start standardizing how these things could be filled out, finding the patterns, doing sort of gap analysis, strengths and weaknesses, and starting to automate as much as we can. And so one thing I really like about Hugging Face is there's a focus on 
how to create sort of end-to-end -end machine learning development processes that are as smooth as possible. And so mm -hmm. I really wanted to uh, do something like that with model cards where you could have something largely automatically generated as a function of different questions that are asked or even just basics of the model specification directly. So I'm working towards, and I think other, you know, other people in the field are working towards the ability to have model cards that are as filled out as possible and then separately that are also interactive. So this was one of my last, I guess, big projects at Google was around creating interactive cards where, for example, you can see the difference in the false negative rate as you move the decision threshold. So normally with classification systems, you choose some threshold at which you say yes or no. It's like 0.7. But in practice, you actually want to vary the decision thresholds in order to trade off the different kind of errors. But that means having like a static report of how well it works uh, isn't actually something that is as informative as you want it to be, because actually you want to know how well it works as different decision thresholds um, are chosen. Right. And actually, theoretically, you could use that to decide what decision threshold to be using with your system. And so we created this model card where you could like interactively change the decision threshold and see how all the numbers changed. And moving in that direction of further automation and, and interactivity I think is, de is definitely the way to go. That's brilliant. And I feel like that would be so powerfully used in the future too, just to have better awareness about those thr thresholds in general. Right, yeah. Some people yeah. like don't even know that that's a thing. Yeah. When Amazon first started putting out facial recognition and facial analysis technology, it was found that like the gender classification disproportionately was bad for black women and Amazon sort of responded to that by saying like oh this was done using the wrong decision threshold and then one of the police agencies who had been using one of these systems were asked what decision threshold they were using and they said oh we're not using a decision threshold <laughs> Which is like, oh. oh, you really don't understand how this works, and you're using yeah. it out of the box with default parameter settings. Uh, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah. So, like, minimally having this documentation brings people aware, brings people like, brings people to be aware that you have some decisions to make with respect yeah. to the various type of parameters. Yeah, that is wild. It continues to blow my mind how often things are released that haven't been run by these basic kind of checks and balances. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Blows my mind. I remember when the yeah. pandemic started, I wanted to record a podcast with my friend who's a black woman and Google just released the uh, Google meet record. And so I talked her into, I was like, we'll just use that. It'll be super easy. And the entire recording is just of me because it didn't, it didn't recognize when she was speaking. Yeah. I was so upset. I couldn't believe yeah. that was yeah. even possible. Like, Why didn't you test that? And it's it's oh. the culture, right? It's just not, it's the people who develop models often don't care about all those other things. And so they're just getting out models, getting out models and right. they're not tested and they're not explained in terms yeah. of how they work in part because no one knows because it hasn't been tested. And that's so different than everything else we put out, you know, yeah. like, toys and medicine and cars, right? There's yes. all these like strategies of how you really test this to see if this works. And that just isn't there in machine learning in yes. part because it's new. So like the laws and regulations don't exist yet. It's sort of like the wild west or whatever. But yeah, mm -hmm. that's part of what we're trying to change <laughs> by doing things like yeah. model cards and data, data sheets and stuff. Just I'm curious if you can speak a little bit more to your day-to-day -day work at Hugging Face and the the things you're working on? Yeah, at this, at this point, I'm kind of all over the place. So I'm working on a few different tools. So that's like coding as well as design specifications for, for other engineers. I'm also working on more 
philosophical or social science-y kind of research. So I just did a deep dive into UDHR, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and how those can be applied within artificial intelligence. So I've been doing more and more research that kind of bridges gaps between AI, machine learning, and law and philosophy. And then I've also been trying to develop some statistical methods that are helpful for testing systems as well as understanding data sets. So we recently put out a tool that was just playing around with uh, showing how well the language mapped to like Zipfian distributions, which is how natural language tends to, tends to go. And so you can test how well your model is massing to natural language that way. So I've been working on those kinds of things. And then also a lot on the cultural stuff. So spending yeah. a lot of time on how to do hiring and what kind of processes we might have in place to be to be more inclusive and things like that. And then also working on big science, which is uh, this massive effort with people, you know, throughout the world, not just hugging face. But within that, I've been working on data governance. So how data can be used and examined without having it proliferate all over the world without it being tracked and how it's used. So my day right now is just chaotic. Like I'm just yeah. hopping <laughs> between each of these things. And then like occasionally I'll do an interview or like I'll talk to a senator or something. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, it's crazy. It's all over the place. So, you know, I try up. and answer emails sometimes. That's part of my oh, day, but gosh. I don't do it as much as I should. <laughs> that is so funny. It makes me feel a little bit better hearing that from you because that. That is so the current culture of the startup that is hugging face. Yeah. Is everybody wears lots of hats. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's just like trying to trying to keep on top of all these things and they're, they're so totally. diverse. <laughs> yeah. That's incredible. Uh, it was really, really sweet. So I had interviewed Louis Tunstall earlier today and told him how I was going to be speaking with you later this afternoon. And he spoke so highly of you. Everyone at Hugging Face just adores you. And That's really nice to hear. <laughs> I mean, it's it's honestly like I feel like you are such a bright light here at the company. And it was cool to hear it from an engineering perspective like Lewis because, you know, he had mentioned how as a machine learning engineer and a team full of some of the top engineers in the world, we're all aware of data ethics. We're all aware right of bias data, but Meg has shown up and put this incredible lens on it and shown us things and made us more aware of things that we had no idea and, you know, possibly oh, wow. been overlooking. And it was just, he said it in the most powerful, beautiful way. I was bummed I wasn't recording it because oh. I think that is the power that having you and bringing this experience and insight and perspective to the table. And it's incredibly powerful. So thank That's you. Really yeah, thank yeah, you. And, and I asked him, I was like, well, what questions do you think I should make sure and ask Meg? And he, he went to his bookshelf. He got a, a book that he's been reading that you're featured in called Genius Makers. Are you aware of this? Oh, yeah. Cade. Okay. Uh, Cade yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He interviewed me for that. I I really... I thought it was very sweet of him because he interviewed me for it while I was at Google and Google PR generally didn't let me talk to anyone. When a journalist asked to talk to the people working on ethics and fairness, they'd give like an, a VP, <laughs> someone who actually yeah. wasn't working on it, but like was, you know, more Google representative or whatever. But Cade knew me already. He had already been following my work. And so he was like, no, I want to talk to Meg. Yeah. <laughs> so he yes. like specific, specifically was like, if I want to know more about this, I talk to her. Like, I don't care what the yes. PR people are saying. So I was just like, I was so indebted to him for that. And I was so excited to be able to talk to him. So I ended up talking to him a lot more about like my history and like working in these different places. And then, yeah, that ended up being able to make it into the, to the book, which was really cool. I love that story. I think it just speaks volumes too of, you know, Lewis was mentioning this is 
a historical AI book. You know, Meg is a legend. <laughs> this was oh, how man. cool to be a part of that bigger story <laughs> and play a role. That's really yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah. I was just so flattered and honored that he, he wanted to include anything I had to say. It was, it was really cool. So I've got this last part of our interview where I go through rapid fire questions. Okay. So uh, best piece of advice for someone looking to get into AI machine learning? Best piece of advice. Uh, I guess it depends who the people person is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um I, I would I would maybe it depends, yeah, if it's someone with like marginalized characteristics or not, I would give very different advice. If it was a woman, I would say don't listen to like your supervisors telling you you're not good at this. <laughs> Cuz everyone will yeah. get that or tons of people get that. Don't listen to yeah. that. Chances are you're just thinking about things in a way that's different than they're used to. So, uh have have confidence in yourself. Um, I guess if it's someone with more majority characteristics, I would say, like, forget about the pipeline problem, pay attention to the people around you and make sure that you hold them up too, uh, so that yeah. the pipeline problem that you're in right now uh, is less of a problem. Um, and I guess I would also say, evaluate your systems. <laughs> what are some of the industries you're most excited to see machine learning applied or machine learning ethics applied? Yeah, most excited. Well, I guess the health domain and the assistive yeah. domain continue to be areas that I care a lot about and I see a lot of good potential. Yeah. I also really, really want to be able to have systems that assist people in terms of understanding their own biases. So like there's lots of technology that's being developed for like screening candidates for job interviews and things yeah. like that. But really I feel like the technology should be focusing on the interviewer <laughs> and yeah. how they might be coming at the situation with different biases. And so I would really love to have technology that focuses more on assisting humans to be more inclusive as opposed to assisting humans to exclude people. Yeah. You, that's one of my favorite part about several of your talks and interviews is your incredible examples of those situations. And one of my favorites was you mentioned in a keynote how there was a model created to detect criminals and yeah. they were able to identify the pattern the mathematical yeah. pattern between was it like the nose and the, en the edge of your the, mouth? Yeah, the corners, the corners of the mouth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and like they were making this huge claim that there was like this angle theta that they discovered that was more indicative of criminals if it was a smaller angle. But like yeah. I was thinking about it and I was looking at the math and I realized that what they were describing was the difference between a smile where you have a wide yes. angle and yeah. a straight face where you have a much more narrow right. angle. And I was like, wow, they really, <laughs> they really missed the boat on what they're actually capturing there. <laughs> yeah. oh, so Experimental wild. bias. Yeah, wanting to find yeah. things that aren't there. Should people be afraid of AI taking over the world? There's a lot of things to be afraid of with AI. I, I like to see it as we have a distribution over different kinds of outcomes, some more mm -hmm. positive than others. So there isn't some set, at least not one that we can know. There are a lot of different things where AI can be just super helpful, super assistive, possibly task-based as opposed to more general intelligence. And you could see it going the other way Similar to this example I had given about um, thinking something destructive was beautiful, <laughs> like yeah. that's one hop away from yeah. if the system is able to like press a button or the equivalent of press a button to like set off a missile <laughs> or whatever, like yeah. that's an issue. So I don't think people should be scared per se, but I do think that they should think about the worst ways that things could go and the best ways that things can go and aim for the best ways yeah. <laughs> and try and 
mitigate right. <laughs> or or stop the worst ways. I think the biggest issue right now is just on how these systems can can widen the divide between, you know, haves and have not really like further further give power to people who have power and you know, further worsen things for people who don't. As the people designing these systems are often people with more power and wealth and they design for their kinds of interests. Yeah. So I think that's the the thing that's happening now and one of the riskiest things to be thinking about in the future. But ideally, if, if we can focus on what's actually most beneficial, <laughs> then we yeah. can lead it in that direction. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, what are some of your favorite machine learning papers? Um, well, I would say most recently, I really loved uh, some of the work that um, Abebe Berhane has been doing around values uh, that are encoded in machine learning. Um, my my own uh, team at Google <laughs> has been, um, or had been, I guess, um, working on data genealogies so really bringing um, critical analyses into how machine learning data is handled. Um, and they have a few papers on that, um, data and its discontents. Um, I really love that work. Obviously, I'm biased, but because it was like my team, like my my uh, direct reports, I'm like very proud of them or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but but it's really fundamentally good work, I think. I'm trying to think of like earlier papers. Those are those are very recent papers. I think the earlier papers I'm most interested in are ones that are more reflective of what I was doing at the time. Um, so I really like the work of um, um, Herb Clark, uh, who was a psycholinguistics communication person, um, and he did a lot of work that's. Um, that's easily ported to computational models about how humans communicate. Um, I just, I really loved his work in my thesis. I like cite like <laughs> all of his work. Um, so yeah, that's, I guess that would be a good set. <laughs> Great answer. Very cool. And we can link to all those two in the show notes, which will be nice for people oh, to cool. check out. Is there anything else you would like to share or mention about the work that you're currently doing or things you would like people to be aware of? One of the things that I'm working on that others should work on, I think, is around lowering the barrier uh, to entry for people from different academic backgrounds to interrogate systems. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of people developing technology and that's great, but we don't have a lot of people who are in a situation where they can really question the technology because there's often a bottleneck where, for example, if you want to know about data directly, you have to be able to like log into a server server and like write yeah. a SQL query. <laughs> so it's like there, where the rubber meets the road, there's a bottleneck where engineers have to do it. And I want to remove that bottleneck. Yeah. Um, so that's a lot of the work I'm doing at Hugging Face now. Like how can we take things that are fundamentally technical code stuff and open it up so that thing is done under the hood and people can directly query without needing to know how to program. Yeah, and I think that's just in general, we are going to be able to make better technology when we remove the barriers that require engineers to be in the middle Absolutely. of what the work should be. Thank you for um, having me and interviewing me. It was very nice of you. I appreciate it. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks. All right. <laughs> Bye. So Meg had a hard stop on the hour, but I was able to ask her my last question offline, which was, what's something you've been interested in lately? Her response, how to propagate and grow plants in a synthetic slash controlled environment. Just when I thought she couldn't get any cooler. Uh, you can keep up with Meg on Twitter. I will link to her Twitter handle here and we'll have it in the show notes. Uh, and I'm going to leave you with a machine learning quote from a recent art article that Meg was quoted in saying, the most pressing problem is the diversity and inclusion of who's at the table from the start. All other issues fall out from there. 
Thank you for listening to Machine Learning Experts. If you or someone you know is interested in direct access to leading machine, machine learning experts like Meg, who are ready to help accelerate your machine learning roadmap, please Google Expert Acceleration Program or go to hf.co support to learn more. Thanks again for joining us, and I hope to see you next time.